Radioactive decay processes. Summary, practice, review, and connect. In this section, we'll use part of a nuclear reaction to complete the missing link when we don't exactly know which kind of decay process it might be. By doing the above, we'll decide what type of decay process occurred, and then we'll also discuss how Geiger counters work, since it's not specific to one type of decay. Let's do some more practice with the emission processes. First, we have an electron emission by carbon-14. We'll start by writing our carbon-14 and then fill in our electron or our beta particle. From here, we know that because we have zero mass, it must still be 14. But since we have six here and a negative one here, it must be that our proton count is at seven. We look at our periodic table and we see that that gives us nitrogen. From here, let's go on to the next problem. I have alpha emission of radon-210. We should go to the periodic table and look up the number of protons first, so we know what we're dealing with. From here, we know that we have an alpha particle, and we have 4, 2. And now we look to see what's left over. 210 minus 4 is 206. 86 minus 2 is 84. That, when looking at the periodic table, gives us PO, or polonium, and we have our equation. Let's do another one. In this case, we have magnesium 26, and rather, under, rather than undergoing a completely spontaneous radioactive process, we first bombard it with protons, and then it undergoes an alpha emission. So now we have something a little bit different happening. We haven't spoken about this in specific, but we know how to balance these reactions, and we can do that. So over here, our masses are 26 and one, leaving us 27. That means that we, for our missing particle, we have 27 minus 4, which leaves us with 23. Similarly, for our protons, we have a 12 over here and a 1 here, which is 13. 13 minus 2 is 11. We look on our periodic table, and that's sodium. So we can balance these reactions and find missing pieces, even for things that we haven't exactly talked about. This last one we're gonna do is actually relatively important in terms of something that we're gonna talk about next in a different video. We have uranium-235, and once again, it's not undergoing this decay process completely spontaneously. We have to first bombard it with neutrons, and then it splits into two parts. So let's add up all of our numbers on each side. Here, we have a 236 combination from masses and 92 for our atomic numbers. Over here, so far, we have 233 as our masses and we have 92 as our atomic number. So we can see that whatever is left over must have an atomic number equal to zero. There's three of them that are all the same. They must have zero as their atomic number. Now let's look at the masses. Total, they must have a mass of 3, since here we're sitting at 236, here we're sitting at 233. However, note that there are three of these, which means that each, each one must have a mass unit of 1, since this will give us a mass unit of 3 and a proton count of 0. What particle do we have that has a mass unit of 1 and no charge? Well, that's N and so we know that it must release three neutrons. Keep this reaction in mind as we move on to the following sections. Now, let's briefly talk about Geiger counters. You may have seen this in videos or in movies, especially post-apocalyptic nuclear type movies, and they use these in order to test for radioactive fallout to decide whether it's safe to go back into an area if, let's say, a nuclear bomb has gone off or perhaps a nuclear reactor has blown up and they use this to check. And you'll hear in mo old movies making clicks and pops and noises like that. So here's what happens. This diagram down here shows us that you have ionized gas if you have radiation. Normally you just have gas inside this container. And if you only have gas in here, this is not a complete circuit. If you look at the circuit, even if you don't know a ton about electrical engineering, you can see we have a missing circuit here. However, if radiation comes in, the radiation ionizes all of the gas inside here. 
that ionized gas allows a complete circuit to occur, and that complete circuit will read a voltage if you wanted it to, but that's rather difficult to see. Or you can set up a system where the electric where the current will be read out instead as an audible clicking noise, so you can just listen as you walk around. This tends to work really well with alpha or beta particles, not so much with gamma radiation. It's not very good at testing that but when it comes to nuclear fallout from bombs or nuclear reactors, that's not a problem. There's plenty of this radiation to be able to test for. And yes, in case you were wondering, yes, there is an app for that. You can actually get little mini Geiger counters to attach to your iPhone in case you are in fact prepping for an apocalyptic post-nuclear doomsday. I'll note at that point, there probably won't be electricity to charge your iPhone, but that's besides the point. So in review, Given a part of a nuclear reaction, even one that we haven't seen before, you can complete the rest of it simply by balancing the mass and charge numbers. Then if needed, you can use a periodic table to determine the proper element that is left if it isn't just one of the subatomic particles that we talked about.